Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Plutonium Bunny. In today's video, I'll be showing you how I turned this weak beta toaster into an alpha furnace with temperature control and over 1000 degrees Celsius temperature capability. Really, this project is much more of a meme than it looks. I basically had this broken toaster and looked at it and wondered how much of a furnace I could build with it while spending as little money as possible. As it turns out, the answer is quite a lot. This furnace is temperature controlled using a cheap Chinese PID controller and thermocouple, and those components were the only thing I had to spend money on, so the total cost for this furnace is $30. While I take apart this toaster in triple speed, I should probably give a life update. I have now begun my PhD in nuclear chemistry, so that's what's been eating up most of my time recently. It is unclear how much time I'll have for making videos, but rest assured, I have plans to post many more videos covering wild, and potentially hazardous projects. In the meantime, if there is any interest in videos showcasing some of the unusual and also hazardous elements that my lab works with, let me know in the comments and I'll see if I can put something together. We have more radioactive elements than you could dream of. <laughs> Anyhow, after I had taken the toaster apart, I unwound some of the heating coils from their mica insulation boards. I also actually found the busted section of nichrome wire that killed the whole toaster. Bad toaster. The best way to release stress in the coils was to power them up until they glowed orange, so I did that to make them more pliable before grabbing a 1 quarter inch rod that I had lying around and winding the nichrome wire to create nice tight coils. This worked very well, but before I went further, I actually heat treated these coils with a propane torch just to ensure that they would keep their shape once I removed them from the rod. These coils actually kind of remind me of the classic slinky toy. A slinky toy that gets hot enough to burn your whole house down. That's more like it. Once both the coils were off the rod, I stretched them out to separate the coils, making sure to keep the spacing about even. I really didn't plan this step very much. Mostly I just stretched them until they seemed like they were pretty well separated and not really bunched up in any places. Next, I connected the coils straight to the 120 volts out of the wall and determined the correct length of coil to get a healthy orange glow from that 120 volts. With this done, I cut the coils to about the right length and then doubled over tabs of nichrome wire. These I attached to the coils to serve as current feed throughs and what was special about these was that the double thickness of nichrome would mean they don't get quite as hot which will be helpful because they'll end up going through a fire brick in a very small hole and could overheat otherwise. This is what the coil ends looked like when completed. Once these coils were completed, I moved on to building some of the forms for my custom fire bricks. I was designing the whole furnace to be of a hexagonal kiln style construction, so I made the form for the bricks with 120 degree angles, and then also one form for hexagonal top and bottom tiles. This right here is how the brick form fits together, so I'll be making six of these bricks. Conveniently, the very sloped sides make for easy release of the bricks during the packing and drying process, which is important later. And here is how the hexagonal form laid out before I glued it together. I found that a really good secret here is to use normal painter's tape just as a sort of gluing uh, form or sort of clamp, because it was much easier than finding a magical hexagonal clamp. Actually, I'm pretty sure I just made that up. Those totally are not a thing. To make my fire brick recipe, I started by mixing approximately equal parts by mass of fire clay and sand. To this, I added a lot of perlite from the garden section of the home improvement store. Really, here it is best to have a very perlite heavy mixture so that the insulative properties of the mix will be maximized and cracking of the finished bricks due to excess clay content will be minimized. I mix this together by hand, making sure to avoid the cloud of definitely healthy clay dust. A little sprinkle from the garden watering can helped to keep the dust down, and so once the mix was moist but not quite drenched, I mixed it together and then added a plastic liner to my form to help with release. Then I packed in the refractory mixture, taking care not to compact it too much and crush all the perlite. Really here it's best to have the mixture squished but not quite demolished, otherwise again the refractory properties of the mixture will be diminished. 
Once each brick was made, the plastic liner came in really handy and made releasing the bricks quite simple. Once they were out of the form, I kept the bricks loosely covered by the same plastic liner, and this was just to help, again, slow the drying and minimize cracking. I didn't experience too many issues with cracking, but perhaps it's because I slowed down the drying. I repeated the same process for the top and bottom hexagonal bricks, but this time I packed in the mixture only to about the halfway point before I placed a piece of steel wire mesh, about maybe half an inch grid spacing, in the mixture to act as a reinforcement and hopefully prevent any failures due to cracking. Then I packed in the mix the rest of the way and set aside the brick to dry. I did the same for the top brick, but this time I also added a piece of plastic round stock to act as a form, and this would become the viewing hole in the top. The round stock I used was just a piece of melted plastic milk bottle cap, and it worked well to create a hole that I can also add metal to the furnace using while it's still operating without taking the lid off. After a few weeks had passed and the bricks were dry, I used a paper template to mark the start and end points for the heating element grooves. These were designed to line up as a complete spiral once all six bricks were put together. I used a regular woodworking file to carve out these grooves, and this worked very well. The bricks were fairly soft, so it was easy work, but I had to make sure not to go too fast, or else I would risk breaking the bricks. I also used the same file to create a lip inside the grooves so that gravity would help hold the elements in and keep them from falling out. Then I tested the elements to ensure that they had a proper fit. They fit well, so then next I made holes for the thermocouple and current feed-throughs using a drill bit. The bricks were soft enough that I really didn't think using a power drill would be smart, so I just did this part by hand, and that seemed to work just fine. To make the frame for the furnace, I grabbed an old microwave and hacked it apart using sheet metal snips. Then I bent the pieces into shape using this absolutely, totally professional sheet metal brake that I improvised with a few old clamps and a discarded motorcycle battery. Actually, I think it worked pretty well, all things considered. After this was done, I had a great looking sheet metal hexagon and a matching bottom for this hexagon. Considering the setup that I used to manufacture these parts, I'm actually quite surprised that they fit as well as they did. In the end, the frame for my furnace really reminded me of one of those classic Christmas cookie tins, only darker, more evil. I mean, don't you think this should be filled with Christmas cookies? Ah, uh, well, it's not. I also added some standoffs for the thermocouple as well as the temperature control board. Then I began the process of trying to squeeze the bottom hexagon brick into the furnace frame. This part actually scared me because it totally seemed like the whole thing would break and ruin all the work, but in the end, I got it to fit without incident. With this brick in place, I used some extra fiberglass housing insulation to shore up the cracks between the brick and the sheet metal. This will both prevent the brick from moving and also cracking, and it will also keep more heat in and less heat getting to the furnace exterior, although it is important to mention that this insulation can melt. This is what the inside of the furnace looked like after installing the nichrome coils. Overall, for a completely homemade refractory mix that wasn't even fired before use, I'm pretty happy with how the bricks held up during manufacturing. There are definitely some areas of chipping, but nothing that was too unmanageable. The current carrying leads for the nichrome coils stuck out of the furnace just like this, and I used some of the mica insulative sheets from the original toaster to make some insulating discs that would go on each coil to prevent any shorting out on the frame of the furnace. Here you can see how they're installed with bolts to connect the toaster heat proof wires to the nichrome coils. I'm running the coils in a center tapped configuration where one end of each coil is connected to the other and also to electrical hot and then both ends are connected to electrical neutral. I then installed the thermocouple mounting plate and the thermocouple itself, just twisting it into the recycled milk jug plastic. The thermocouple actually barely peaks into the furnace, so I'm not sure if it needs any more exposure to get the temperature right. For the first run of the furnace, I just hooked it up to a variac from an old gel electrophoresis power supply and used a very low voltage to heat it slowly, driving off any water without cracking. 
Then, of course, I ran it at full blast, and it was awesome. Here is the whole setup for the first firing. Just using a simple digital multimeter on the thermocouple to read its voltage, which can be converted using online charts into temperature. Mmm, the red glow of evil. Here's my totally OSHA approved electrical setup to power the furnace. It's not permanent. After I let things cool down slowly, I checked on things to see how the furnace fared. The heat fired the bricks to a nice pink color and everything was actually pretty intact. The thermocouple did suffer some oxidation, but all the coils were still okay, so I would chalk this up as a huge success. As a side note, the household insulation is not rated for high temperatures and will melt. Good to know. With the furnace duly tested, I loaded it up with some aluminum in a soup can and popped the lid on. The PID controller did eventually arrive from the slow boat from China, but by then I was mostly done with this project and totally forgot to film installing it. Here it's been set to 750 degrees Celsius. After about an hour or so, things were looking pretty well done inside, so then it was finally time to take out the aluminum and actually do the first pour. This casting is for another project and will hopefully get its own video in the future. As a side note, I need some help. My PID controller currently has an issue where the temperature reading gets to about 100 degrees below the set point. If you know what I need to change to fix that, let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching.